Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to the India Power Talk. Uh, India Power Talk is a knowledge sharing initiative. Uh, we invite international thought leaders and domain experts to share their insights, experiences, and strategies related to business and economy. Uh, today, we will talk about Indo-German business cooperation. It's my pleasure to welcome a highly qualified guest to speak about Indo-German commerce, current initiatives, and future plans, uh, Mr. Bernard Steinrucke, former Director General of Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, IGCC. So Mr. Steinrucke, welcome to the India Power Talk, and thank you so much for taking time to join me. Uh, you have a vast experience in India. Now, please, could you begin by talking about how you first became interested in the country and its business community? First of all, Nitin, thank you very, very much for inviting me for the India Power Talk. It's an honor for me to be with you today. My first interest in the country was more or less by accident. It was in 1993, I was the director general or the general manager, it was called, of Deutsche Bank in Sri Lanka. And I got a call from my boss in Singapore. And he said, you know, we need someone in India. Would you be interested? So I told him in 1993 that I have never been to India. I don't know the country. Uh, I know it is difficult, but I will be there anyway in Mumbai, at that time Bombay, next week. So I told him that I would be interested, but I would like to first go have a look and then decide. So he said, no, nothing doing. You have to decide now. So I thought, oh, that man has a problem. So I said, okay, I will do it. And I went. And so it was more by accident than by choice, but I never regretted it. You know, Dr. Steinrucke, the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce is very active, as I mentioned to you on many fronts. Now, could you tell us what are some of the favorite current highlights in the, with the Indian, uh, in, with the IGCC? I would say at the moment, one of the highlights is an initiative by the chamber to bring companies, member companies together with their Corona activities. So SAP has developed a special IT system where companies can interact, can communicate with their Corona initiatives. And I think that is something very, very important. German companies over the last decades have been active when there was a dire need in India, whether it was the earthquake in Bhutan whether it was the tsunami, whether it was other calamities, German companies were always there to help. And I think that at the moment is the most important activity. So Mr. Steinrucke, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, commerce between Germany and India has uh, a long history and continues to develop. Now, in what way has the relationship really grown in the recent years? And and where do you really see room for further improvement? Today in Pune, we have more than 300 German companies, and most of them came after 2006, 2007. Um, and when we saw that India became sort of the darling uh, in Asia of German companies, we had big, big initiatives in the trade fair business uh, when India was the partner country of Hanover Fair in 2006, India was the partner country of Frankfurt Book Fair in 2006, India was the partner country of the ITB, the tourism fair in uh, Berlin in 2007, in 2008, it was the partner country of ILA, the aviation show in Berlin in 2010, it was the partner country of Bauma, the uh, construction equipment fair in Munich, and we could continue like this. This is how basically uh, in Germany with incredible India, India became very popular. And this is when German companies basically realized that they have to be in India. Then of course we had the Indo-German year 2011, 2012, infinite opportunities where we had this big, big roadshow in India Indo-German Urban Mela, where we presented up to 20 German companies in Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, Delhi, and Pune with more than 500,000 visitors. And then we established a, a strategic partnership 
between India and Germany, and we started the intergovernmental consultations where the German Chancellor and the Indian Prime Minister meet every two years with their cabinet members to discuss the state of affairs and to discuss their strategic partnership. I think this development really gave a boost to Indo-German relations, not only for trade and investment, but also for employment. And when we see today how many people, German companies employ in India, directly and indirectly, and with uh, agents, for instance, in the insurance industry, with franchise partners, with the dealers, we're talking about more than 500,000 people. And thus, Germany is one of the largest employer in India. How many uh, Germans, I, I guess a lot of Germans also must be working in India. So uh, could, you put, could you please dwell upon that? Well, we don't have the official numbers. And actually, there are not so many Germans okay. in India. We're talking about maybe 8,000 Germans that are in India. Uh, most of them actually are in Pune and in Delhi. Um, but this has gone, I would say, down quite a bit in the recent years because we have so qualified Indians. So there is no need to have these ex very expensive Expert. expatriates mm -hmm. um, because you have these outstanding Indians. And when you look at it today, different from the time when I came first in 1993, today, most of the German companies in India are run by highly qualified Indian CEOs and MDs. And it's quite remarkable. But even if you look the other way around, few people know that in the German DAX companies, which are the largest German listed companies, in so many of them, we have Indians as members of the board. Where do you see a room for further improvement between, between how do we develop more uh, collaborative atmosphere? Well, I think the room is vast because India is still uh, one of the big growth markets in the world. German companies have such a good reputation here. So from that angle, I think there are vast opportunities. We can see it already, of course, companies like Siemens or Bosch or others, they are household names in India. And also, interestingly enough, there are some 15 German companies that are listed in India. But when you look at the various industries, I see a lot of potential in the field of IT. So SAP, for instance, has had a dramatic development yes. of some uh, 50 people uh, in the 1990s to now more than 15,000 direct employed, but some 40,000 SAP experts in the Indian companies. Yeah. Plus, I know there are, there are really, really large chemical companies in, in German chemical companies in India. Of course, there are big German uh, chemical companies in India. BASF um, has uh, invested heavily a few years ago. They, in, they uh, opened a development hub in Navi Mumbai, where they invested 60 million euros. It's one of the largest, worldwide largest uh, development hubs, very successful. And I have to say, when, you know, seeing is believing. You have to have seen absolutely. their labs over there is absolutely uh, outstanding. Uh, now, from the big companies, you know, I know like India, Germany also has hundreds of mid-size, you know, it's called as middle, middle stand companies, uh, uh, mid-size and family-owned companies. And I know many of them uh, wish to do business. They, many of them are doing business in India. And many of them wish to do business in India. Could you dwell upon some of them as to their structure, their way of working, and how do you see them working in India? Well, you're absolutely right. And when you look at the sheer numbers, most of the German companies are still family-owned, so-called Mittelstand, way beyond 90%. And this also holds true for most of the 1,800 German companies present in India. Most of them are these family-owned Mittelstands companies. Of course, they are not the usual SMEs as we know them maybe in India, but um, they have been there for generations. Many of them are so-called hidden champions. That means they are world champions in their niche. Well, not that nobody knows them, but not so well-known, but very, very successful. And many of them are, of course, 
in India and also there, they are very successful. And I mean, company like Freudenberg, for instance, yeah, they have uh, more than 10 subsidiaries in India. Mm -hmm. They are still family owned. Um, they've been there. They've been there for more than 200 years and um, highly successful, but not so well known. But in their niches, they are world champions. When you look at a company like Trumpf, owned by the family Leibinger, they are mm -hmm. based in Pune. That mm -hmm. is another good example. Or the company Stiel, owned mm -hmm. by the family Stiel, again, based in Pune. Or when you look at a company Wirt, uh, they have various subsidiaries in India, for instance, also in Pune, and again, family-owned, very successful, and a big player in their niche. Or when you look at a company like Festo, mm -hmm. that's a company uh, has been in India for more than 50 years, based out of Bangalore, extremely successful, and um, family-owned. So I, I could go on like this. I can imagine. Uh, are there are there any similarities between the family in German family companies and Indian family companies, or or I would I would really you know uh, love to hear from you as to uh, what should uh, Indian family family companies or small mid sized companies should do, what precaution they should be taking when 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 they strike collaborations with these uh, family companies. Actually, you're absolutely right, and there are quite some similarities when you look at a company like Bharat Forge. Uh, Baba Kalyani, who incidentally is also on the committee of the chain. Or when you look at a company like Force Motors, Ferodia. Um, or when you look at a company like Bajaj Allianz or many of the other, incidentally, many of them are also based in Pune. Maybe one of the main differences, I would say, between the Indian and the German family-owned companies is that many of the Indian companies are listed. Are listed. The German Mittelstand is not listed. Most of them are not listed. Somehow they don't believe um, that being listed is necessary for their business. Um, they believe in basically 100% ownership and they are able and they were able to fund their expansion over the years, over the decades with their own resources uh, because they believe in A, being profitable, and B, in keeping the money in the company. How could we fast forward the collaborations? Uh, because I know for a fact, uh, Mr. Steinbrucke, that there are a lot of, lot of mid-sized German companies who are still hungry to come to Indian market and they are still waiting. So what could we do from India uh, to, uh, to really accelerate that process? At the moment, we have the challenge of Corona, which is a sort of uh, hindrance yes. for everybody. But that will go, there is no doubt about it. So as soon as Corona is behind us, the main thing is that we have to have a very, very good image of it. And the image building is something where India was extremely successful with Incredible India, with Make in India, with other initiatives. So this, after Corona, we have to reactivate. That yes. is one very, very important aspect. Um, the other aspect, of course, is, and we've seen it uh, just before Corona and during Corona, the German government started a new initiative for their approach towards Asia. And it is an Indo-German roadmap, an Indo-Pacific roadmap, roadmap. So far, we were always talking about Asia Pacific. The German government changed it and now it's called an Indo-Pacific strategy. And there the German government has basically said that we have to look beyond China. Um, so far, there was a strong, strong focus of the German government, but also of the German industry towards China, which is understandable. It's a huge market and you have to be in China. There's no doubt about it. But we have to look beyond China. And there certainly India has a strong role to play. What we also need uh, is ease of doing business. And there also India has made some efforts, but it's not enough. 
uh, before I really move uh, from the economic front, I would still like to you know uh, ask you one more question about uh, about the companies taking uh, you know we talk spoke about the dual education system and uh, we I, I mentioned to you about how companies German companies are ad adopting and taking the the students and then they get on, on the training is offered online now could you dwell a little bit more upon that because uh, I'm, I'm sure you are aware of the fact that in India the in industry academia is not happening the way it ought to happen. Um, so could you a little bit dwell upon that? Yes, you're absolutely right. In Germany still today, about 50% of every school leaving generation goes through that vocational training. Now in India, the approach is different. In India, the companies are saying, well, you know, why should we employ someone who we're even supposed to teach? It is not an option. You have to skill them. And this is what we as the chamber have been propagating for the last 30 years. So skilling is one of the core elements of the German success story. We call it also lifelong learning. Uh, see, of course, the, our two countries are culturally uh, di very different. Uh, where, but where do you see the, uh, do you see really a largest stumbling block? And uh, what advice would you really give to Indian and German business people to avoid, avoid them? Yes. <laughs> so indeed, these cultural ties are very strong and very close. And this is also one of the reasons why Germans feel so comfortable in India, but also why Indians feel so comfortable in Germany. When you look at it, maybe the most dramatic development in the last 20 years that I spent in India now was the number of Indian students studying in Germany. Yes. It has skyrocketed. Um, also, when we had the Germany year 2011-2012, one of the most spectacular events, I would say, was the fusion, one could say, between A.R. Rachman and the Babelsberg Film Orchestra. Mm -hmm. He wrote a song for them. They came to India on a, on a tour, playing with him, and he played with them in Potsdam, close to Berlin. And that was absolutely spectacular. And also, interestingly enough, sponsored by a German family-owned company, the company Lab Kabel. Uh, Mr. Steinrucke, let me now move to uh, the current pandemic situation. You know, as the economies emerge from the hardship of pandemic, international commerce will play, I guess, a key role in recovery. Now, how can we ensure that Indo-German commerce will have maximum positive effect and uh, what is your what is your forecast for the future? Well, one thing is for sure, <clears throat> we need open markets. Without open markets, there is no innovation. Without open market, there is also no competition, and we also know without competition, um, th there is no there growth. Is no, there is no growth. So we need open markets, and uh, we've seen it with the U.S. and China conflict what it means when markets try to basically close themselves. It does not work. And therefore, after the pandemic is over, the most strict thing is that we have open markets. Uh, so finally, looking back on your years of experience in India, uh, could you share uh, some of your favorite memories and uh, which especially you'd like to cherish? Well, uh, as I said, uh, the first Indian woman I met in my life became my wife for life. Uh, we have two wonderful children. Uh, they are sort of our best Indo-German joint ventures that I know. Um, uh, so that certainly has been uh, important. But also for me, Indo-German Chamber of Commerce has been my life now for the last more than two decades, almost three decades, I've been associated with the chamber. And um, India, Bombay is the city where I have lived the longest in my life. I've lived in many beautiful cities. I lived in uh, Vienna, I lived in Geneva, I lived in Hamburg, I lived in Heidelberg, in Berlin, beautiful cities. But I never lived as long in a city as in Mumbai. Mumbai. And I never lived in a city twice. I always moved on, but Mumbai, I came back. And so from that angle, Mumbai is absolutely important for me. 
Um, and I've seen all the changes that Mumbai has. I can still see them as they are now there. Um, but the friendships in India, the bonding is something very special. And so from that angle, the last so many years have been very important for me. You mentioned the culture side. As you may know, my wife has a gallery for contemporary Indian art. We even used to run a gallery in Berlin. So also when it comes to culture, India is very important for me. Um, I'm little active in the Meli Meta Music Foundation, foundation that Maestro Zubin Meta has started in the name of his father. And we are educating, teaching about a thousand young Indian kids from very often very simple background in Western classical music. So that is also an element of activity that I really, really enjoy. And therefore it is business, but it is also culture that comes together. And that is something for me very special. Uh, all that, uh, the Mr. Stein, okay, I, all that I can say is that I must wholeheartedly thank you personally uh, for your incredible services to India. And uh, we all will remain uh, we know, indebted to you for your continuous support um, uh, to India and the Indian business, the culture. Uh, so once again, uh, Mr. Steinruke, thank you very much for your valuable time and insight. It has been really a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Also a pleasure for me to talk to you. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Indian Chamber of Commerce, Law Seco, and the India SME Accelerator Network uh, for supporting this talk. Uh, let me conclude uh, our talk with the humble prayer to the Almighty to bestow mankind with the right spirit to fight the coronavirus and help restore peace, prosperity, and well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>